Welcome to the Maranatha Bible Class with Bible teacher Bob Suriano. friends I'm glad that you can join me today I'm very excited to start a, a brand new teaching uh, that I've been looking forward to for quite some time and I'm going to be teaching at a first Peter uh, first Peter is a, a tremendous epistle there, there's so much meat in these particular chapters that is just so beneficial to every child of God uh, as we walk through our daily lives and trying to grow spiritually or if you are uh, an individual that has been stagnant in your faith for quite some time well I hope today is the day that you repent and get back uh, on the straight and narrow path and, and walk in holiness uh, with the Lord and I just I can't say enough about getting into this book I'm very excited and I want to just share some things verse by verse I'm gonna just break it down I'm gonna be reading from the uh, the English Standard Version today so I would like for you to, to follow along in your Bible uh, there may be a few words here and there that are gonna differ uh, but the gist uh, the meat of uh, what I'm gonna be sharing with you should be pretty much the same thing in the version that, that you're reading from. So I want to get started right here, but before I do, I'm just going to, I want to pray really fast, um, and I just want the Lord to bless this time. Father, I pray now, Lord, that you will bless this teaching, use this teaching to go forth like a two-edged sword to cut through any obstacles that may be in my brothers and sisters lives right now that would be hindering them from their walk and their growth in Christ father to you I give all the glory all the praise and all the honor for what you're going to do as I teach and as you anoint me Lord to be able to teach this word through the Holy Spirit and I pray that you will bless it and sanctify it in the the matchless, the glorious name of Jesus. Amen and amen. All right, so I'm going to get started. First Peter chapter 1, starting with verse 1. And, and, and I want to just kind of lay a little bit of background for you here. So Peter is writing, we're going to find that he's writing to most likely a lot of the people that came on the day of Pentecost that came to Jerusalem we find this in the book of Acts and there were Jewish people that came from all over the world that were um, scattered for different reasons they had come back to Jerusalem every year this is a uh, basically something all Jewish people need to do and eventually when we get into the millennial reign this will be something even the Gentiles uh, will be um, told that they must do is to come to Jerusalem at the Feast of Tabernacles every year. It's going to be a great celebration with the Lord Jesus sitting, ruling and reigning in Jerusalem and it will be something we will all do. We will all have good godly fellowship. It'll be my, my words can't even begin to describe just how beautiful of a time that will be. But it's going to be a great time. So Peter is writing to 
probably that group of people, but also to anyone else and to us today. We, we always have to remember that. That is the one of the re- that's one of the reasons why it's in Scripture is that God had intended these words to minister, to encourage, to build up in their faith the people that Peter originally wrote it to, but it's not just to them. It applies to us as well. So keep that in mind as we're reading this. And as always, one of the best things you can do when you study the Bible is when you read it, you pray and you ask God, how does this affect me? How can I apply this to my life? How can I become a better disciple of Christ through your word? And let the Holy Spirit begin to do his work in your life and just cultivate you and mold you and make you to the, into the person that you need to be for Christ. That's the most important thing. So, here Peter is, is, is speaking, and it was probably Silas. Most theologians believe that Silas was the one that was writing this for Peter, as Peter dictated it, and as the Holy Spirit inspired Peter to speak these words, and then Silas wrote it down. We know that from Paul, Paul only wrote some of the endings of, of his particular epistles. It was always somebody else that he dictated it to. They were faithful. They wrote everything down that Paul said. And as the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to say those things, and he made sure that the people that were writing it didn't make a mistake. Hallelujah. All right. 1 Peter chapter 1, starting with verse 1. Peter, an apostle. So right here, Peter identifies himself as one of the apostles of Christ. To those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Britannia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Now this is important. Uh, I'm going to give you some basic apologetics here so you can understand and, and find certain things in Scripture if you're ever confronted. For instance, people that don't believe in the Trinity, or a better word for Trinity is the triune Godhead. We're going to see that in this verse. This is absolute proof of the triune Godhead here in these verses. And it also talks about the foreknowledge of God the Father. This goes into uh, God's omniscience, that he knows everything, and there's not anything that he does not know. God knows everything. God is everywhere at all times, and he knows everything. Okay, so the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit. This is referring to the Holy Spirit. Now, sanctification... This is a beautiful word, and I'm going to give you the Greek understanding of the word. It's hagamas. So sanctification in the Greek means hagamas. And it basically means to make pure, to be holy. And it's something that God does in our lives when we come and we kneel at the foot of the cross and we confess our sins and we repent and we ask the Lord to come into our life, to come into our heart, to change us, to make us a new person. We become a born-again Christian. When that happens, the Holy Spirit is given to us as a seal of our salvation, and He keeps us on the straight and narrow path. If we are obedient to Him and we listen to His voice, we follow the direction of the Lord. And this book is our road map it is our if you allow me to say it this way our gps to get through this 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 age to get through our life it is god's compass for us so sanctification is god cultivating us and he is doing a work in our life and i kind of like to use a visual image this way 
So I, I love to garden. I don't have, I have zero time to do it, but I love to be able to plant a good vegetable garden. And like most farmers or most of you that also may like to have a garden, it requires work. And it requires you to go out there and to prepare the soil. You put your plants in the ground and then you have to go back and you have to, and most of you will know this if you've had a garden, immediately when you plant plants and you start watering them and, and maybe put fertilizer down, you, you start to get weeds that'll start popping up everywhere. Those weeds, if you don't pull them out and deal with those weeds, it will choke the life out of the plant that you're trying to get fruit from. So think about that in a spiritual sense. As Christians, we need to allow the Holy Spirit to cultivate in our life all of those things that shouldn't be there. All of the impurities, and it's a variety of things, folks. So don't sit back there and say, well, I'm perfect, you know, there's nothing in me. We all have things. And when we come under the, the spotlight of the Lord, and when he shines his light on us, it's, it's kind of like you walking into a room and you turn the light on and, and let's say there's a bunch of roaches in there. Those roaches go, start to go to, uh, to, to a dark spot to hide. That's kind of like the sin in our lives when God's light shines on us. It exposes all the, the negative things, all the bad things in our life. And, and I'll just throw out a few simple things. It could be we have uh, animosity in our life towards somebody. We have jealousy. We have the uh, unfortunate gift to gossip and to say things about people that we shouldn't be saying. These are the things that we need to allow the Holy Spirit to do that sanctifying work to make us holy to purge out to pull those weeds out of our out of our Christian life hopefully this makes sense to you and if we're truthful we all have a lot of things and, and I, I don't believe that that ever stops I used to attend a particular denomination that believed when you got born again you got filled with the Spirit and you were completely sanctified I never agreed with that philosophy or that theology. I believe that the sanctification work of the Holy Spirit is an ongoing process. He does his work as we allow him uh, to do that work in our lives, as we give our free will up to the Lord and say, Lord, here I am. Come in, change me, mold me, make me into that, that child of God that you would have me to be, not that I want but what you want. And when we become humble and we uh, sincerely come to the Lord in all humility and say, Lord, change me, you got to be careful what you ask for. But in this sense, this is a good thing to ask for because then the Lord's going to go to work because we are allowing him to come in and to change us. And, and I know a lot of Christians that come to Christ in faith initially but they never seem to grow they never seem to allow the Holy Spirit to cultivate and to do that sanctifying work in their lives and therefore they continue to struggle with the same besetting sins over and over and over again they never have the victory they never get beyond some of those and I'll say it this way the childish things to advance to the next level of their faith. And I like to look at, as a Christian, we're constantly moving up on a straight and narrow path, growing in Christ, developing our relationship with the Lord so we can be effective witnesses and disciples of the Lord Jesus. That we can be salt that's extremely salty and that we can be light in a darkening, in an ever darkening world. And that way that the Lord can use us and people will look at us and read our life and we are an open Bible to them. 
and therefore we can be a godly influence and hopefully we will have the privilege and the honor and the opportunity to share Christ with people and oh what a great privilege it is when you can grab somebody's hands and pray with them and lead them to Christ and then when 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 you're done praying and they look up at you and and you can tell by their countenance that they have been rescued they have been saved the sanctifying work is starting in their life right at that moment and the the shackles and the chains of sin have been cut loose and fallen to the ground and there's a new person in Christ at that moment all heaven rejoices and shouting and praising that a soul has come to the come come to the Lord hallelujah there's no better privilege no better honor there's nothing you can do more special and more self-satisfying when you can lead someone else to the to, to the Lord and to Christ so hallelujah so this sanctifying work is something we need to allow the Lord to do in our life and I'm a firm believer my brothers and sisters that we need to do what the Apostle Paul said we need to check ourselves on a regular basis to see whether or not we're in the faith that we're following Christ that we're devoting everything to the Lord and that we are advancing in our Christian walk and not stagnant stagnant Christianity is is really what the Laodicean church was in the book of Revelation and that's what Jesus was really he, he opposes that it, it doesn't please him he said to the pastor of that church I would prefer for all of you to be either cold or hot but never lukewarm and unfortunately I think that's where a lot of Christians are today they're they're straddling the fence they want one foot in the world they want one foot just to barely hang on to, to Christianity just in case if the rapture takes place that they're gonna go uh, we have a lot of nominal Christians which means Christian in name only but not really in, in faith and practice and that is a shame we should always be advancing and moving forward in our relationship with Christ I can't I can't stress this enough uh, to, to all of you my brothers and sisters constantly we got to be renewing our mind and absorbing things of godly value and benefit and uh, that's very very important all right I'm moving on so scripture says and the sanctification of the spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ so here the only way we can really be obedient to the Lord is allowing the Holy Spirit to come in and do that sanctifying work then all of our interests all of our love all of our passions will change from worldly things to godly things and that is what's so important and I can I can tell you and I believe most of you that are watching can share the same thing that when you received Christ before you received Christ you were chasing all the things of the world everything that the world tells you popularity money materialistic things fleshly things and all that encompasses the flesh those are the things that excited us and we chased but one thing that I think if we're all honest we can say is once you have some of those things it's never enough you're never fully satisfied you always want more and that is the that's the negative thing about materialism and chasing money is because there's never enough money because once you have money and you can buy things things don't bring peace they don't bring comfort uh, they're 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 nice to have they make life easier in certain areas but it does not bring joy and peace only a relationship with Christ will give you full joy and peace in your life and that's it all these other things will fade away you'll get tired of them 
and you will move on to the next more exciting thing. That's why when you look at extremely wealthy people that don't know Christ, they're never satisfied, they're never happy, they're always looking to make that next million dollars or whatever it may be, and you look at people that have a lot of materialistic possessions, they're never satisfied with a brand new, you know, very expensive car, they've got to have the next more expensive, more advanced car than the previous one. It's just a cycle that you go through. And it's because God, I believe, God has placed in our heart, in our spirit, our mind, and our soul, that we will never ever actually have peace until we have a relationship with Him. Once we have that relationship with Him, then we have that peace. Doesn't mean all our problems are solved. It doesn't mean that we're not going to go through tribulations and trials, because we are. Doesn't mean we're going to not go through persecution. You absolutely will. You will even be hated as a Christian by the world. So you will have all of those things, but the most amazing thing is you will have the peace of God, and you will be blessed by God, and you will be able to prosper. I'm not talking about the name of claimant stuff. I'm talking about you will prosper in your relationship with the Lord. You'll grow in Christ. You'll be anointed of Christ. You'll be able to lead others to, 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 to the Lord. You'll be able to be an effective witness for the Lord. If you are blessed with finances, you'll be able to give more to the work of God so that other people can find salvation. God will bless you and use you for His will and for His glory. Not yours, not mine, but for His. And that's the most important thing. Hallelujah. All right. Continuing on in the scripture, in verse 2, and for sprinkling with his blood. Now this here is speaking about that we are sanctified through the Holy Spirit by trusting in Christ. We find salvation because of what Jesus did at the cross, what Jesus did at Calvary. Jesus was in heaven. He's fully God. He took part in creation. When, when we read in Genesis where it says, uh, let us make man in our image, that was the triune Godhead talking about, let's create man in our image. And I believe because God wanted to have fellowship with man. And after God created everything, and all three persons took part in creation, uh, th there had to be a plan of salvation because God could not tolerate sin. He cannot uh, allow sin to be in his presence. And... Jesus came down to earth, took on human flesh, and he went to the cross as the ultimate sacrifice, sinless sacrifice, shedding his sinless blood that we could have access to eventually come into God's presence. And it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful plan. God knew this from the very foundation of the earth, that this was going to be the long-term plan because he knew that when he created man and woman, Adam and Eve, and put them in the garden, that eventually they would fall to temptation uh, by the fallen one, Satan, and that God had to create a, another plan of salvation for humanity. And God's plan is a perfect plan. Hallelujah. So now in verse 2, if you look closely, you have God the Father, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus. This is the triune Godhead. So this is proof of the Trinity, the triune Godhead. So those people that come on Saturdays and knock on your front door, they have a different Bible, a polluted, diluted Bible uh, called the New World Translation, and they want to talk to you about the true God, they are representing a false God. And they are the ones that do not believe in the triune God, this is a passage here that proves that, okay? All right. So moving on to verse 3. Blessed be God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now the word Lord there too, I want to make this clear. The word Lord there is kurios in the Greek. And it is the most powerful Greek word 
for Lord. And when you use the same word in the Old Testament, it basically means Jehovah. So it's it literally is a title uh, represented here, proving the deity of Christ, that Jesus is fully God, and on earth he is fully man. So he's both at the same time. All right, according to his great mercy, oh, hallelujah, I could stop here and I could talk an hour on God's mercy alone. God's mercy, and you know, today you hear a lot of hirelings, a lot of men and women now that are in pulpits that were hired to do a position of a pastor, but they're not true shepherds. And a lot of them are now really attacking the Word of God, and they make a distinction between the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. And a lot of what they're saying is the God of the Old Testament was a, was a mean God. He was a God that wanted to kill people and all these other things. Let me say this. <clears throat> Number one, what they're, what they're saying is false doctrine. It's a bunch of garbage. Uh, they are speaking through the anointing of a demon, not of the Holy Spirit, because the God in the Old Testament is the same God in the New Testament. And the God in the Old Testament, and if you can't find it, I don't know what version you're reading, but every English version that I've ever read all say the same thing. You find the mercy and the grace of God throughout the Old Testament. God is holy, he's merciful, and he's a God of grace. And he came up with the plan of salvation because he loves mankind. If that's not mercy, I don't know what is. So if you hear a hireling, a false shepherd, say anything negative about the God of the Old Testament, if I was you and if you're attending that church, I would get up, pack up my Bible, and I would head out and go find another place to go. Because that is a place where there's a false prophet standing in the pulpit. Uh, my God is a God of mercy. In everything I read in Scripture, God is a God of mercy. Hallelujah. Continuing on, he says this, He has caused us to be born again. So here's the same terminology that Jesus told to Nicodemus in the Gospel of John is where we find it, where Nicodemus, a Pharisee, a well-respected, godly man, came to Jesus at night and he was troubled in his spirit. But he knew that Jesus was a man sent from God. He had no doubt about that. And when Jesus told him, it says, Nicodemus, unless a man <clears throat> is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And this is for all of us today. It's not a church belonging to a church, getting baptized in a denomination. It's not having a cross around your neck. It's not praying with beads. It's not confessing your sins to another man. None of that stuff is going to get you into heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to me, uh, uh, no man c gets to the Father except through me. Jesus is the way. And Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. This is a spiritual birth. Man is born by water. He comes th through the natural uh, way that uh, people are born. Through a woman, through her womb, she carries an infant, a baby, a human life, believe it or not, um, regardless of what the world tells us, that baby is born and becomes a human being. And he's already a human being in the womb. So when that person is born, that's born of the flesh, of, the, of water, but a person needs to be born of the Spirit. And that means that a person is spiritually reborn, where they do all the things I said in the beginning. You fall down, you, you basically call out to the Lord and you repent of your sins. You become renewed by the Spirit of God. He comes and lives and dwells within us. And we become born again. Spiritual birth. Without that, 
you're not going to heaven. It's just as, as simple as that. And anyone who teaches anything different than that is a liar, and the truth is not in them. All right, then he goes on, and he says this. He has called us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So here now, Peter is telling us, number one, we have to be born again, and that that is a living hope because we're putting our trust in the person that, that told Nicodemus this. He died at Calvary, went into the grave, went into a tomb, was there for three days, and he came out resurrected. So our hope is in a living, ho glorious hope in Jesus Christ, the firstborn from the dead, to never die again, he, he defeated uh, death once and for all at Calvary. That is what we have hope in. And my brothers and sisters, can I say this? We live in a time where things are continuing to get dark and uncertain, but we have a living hope. Put all your hope in Christ. Don't put hope in your bank account. You know, we don't know how things are going to go here, in, certainly in America. Uh, financially, if, if the whole financial system is going to collapse, and maybe you're like me, you're at that age where, you know, retirement is getting close, can't trust in those things. We have to put our trust in Christ, and we trust in a, a living hope, and that is fabulous, because no, no other religion can say that. So if you look, are looking at Buddhism and you want to follow Buddhism, guess where Buddha is? He wasn't resurrected from the dead. He's in the ground. His, his flesh is rotted. His bones are probably all disintegrated by now. Uh, there's no hope in Buddhism. If you go into Huda, uh, uh, Hinduism, there, there's a lot of different gods in Hinduism. All of the, the living people that claim to be gods in, in Hinduism, they're dead and buried. If you are looking at Islam, Muhammad, Muhammad is dead. He didn't ascend back up to heaven like the Islam teaches. He's dead somewhere. His body is buried somewhere. Uh, there are no living uh, saviors of any other religion except for Christianity. So our hope is not put in a dead person that's buried in the ground. He's a living hope. He's ruling and reigning right now in heaven, and he's coming back soon. The trumpet's about to sound, and uh, the rapture of the church is going to take place, and all those that are dead in Christ are going to rise first, and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So we will go to be with the Lord, and we will rule and reign with him. We will stand at the Bema Seat of Christ when we're there in heaven with the Lord. We will enjoy the marriage supper of the Lamb. And then we will come back with the Lord at the second coming of Christ, at the end of the tribulation period, and we will rule and reign with the Lord on this earth. Hallelujah. Great promises, great hope, great and exciting things to look forward to. So, folks, get your eyes off of the world and put your eyes on Jesus. Get into the Word of God and spend more time studying and reading about the promises and about your future as a child of God. There's nothing more important than our future with the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Sorry I got so excited there. Verse 4, to an inheritance. Hallelujah. I mean, I can go off on that to an inheritance that is imperishable. So everything that Christ accomplished at Calvary, there's a great future. And Jesus said this in John 14. He told his apostles and all the other disciples that were following him, which were many, he said, if I go away, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And where I am, you will be also in my Father's house. There are many mansions actually the greek word there is compartments there's many rooms god is is preparing a place for us to go spend 
time with him. What a beautiful thing. And this is imperishable. These are promises from God that it's an inheritance for us. Uh, you know, I'm not looking for an earthly inheritance because that will vanish away. That will disappear. That can be spent very quickly. But an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, no sin touches it, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Hallelujah. Right there, there's a promise. The Apostle Peter, the man that spent time with Jesus, walking on this earth for a little over three years, he knew a lot, and he's sharing that information here by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And God cannot lie. So these are not fairy tales. This is God's word. It is true. It is something you can depend on and, and hold on to. And folks, I encourage you to put your hope in God's promises, in God's word. Get your hope off of all the worldly things because, you know, it, 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 that is what it is. And it's not dependable. You know, it amazes me how many Christians are putting all their hope, those that live in America, in Donald Trump as their savior. That he's going to win this next election and that he's going to change everything. I see more Christians make Donald Trump their Messiah than they do Jesus Christ. And that is sinful. And you are putting your hope in a man and... You know, I'm not. I'm not bashing him. I'm not going to. I'm not bashing the, the 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 current man that's sitting in the White House. But don't put your hope in a politician, in an earthly vessel. Put your hope in the things and and the trust God. All right, verse five. Who by God's power are being guarded through faith. For a salvation ready to be revealed in this last time. Hallelujah. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. Again, we all go through this. It could be physical. It could be family issues. It could be all kinds of issues. Work issues. Not finding a good job to make you know, decent money to pr take care of your family. That's why you got to trust the Lord that he will meet all your needs. Verse 7, so that the testing, the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire. So we are tested in this world. We are going to go through trials, but we are going to trust that the Lord is going to take care of us. May be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that inexpressible and filled with glory hallelujah so jesus even told thomas after thomas came in when all the apostles were to gather together when jesus was resurrected thomas was told well, i'm not going to believe it there's no way not unless i can stick my finger in where he was where the nails were driven and I could take my hand and I could stick it in his side <clears throat> otherwise I ain't gonna believe that he resurrected from the dead is really what Thomas was saying and Jesus appeared Thomas did exactly what he said he, he would he would stuck his finger and Jesus told him to go ahead stick your finger in here stick your finger in my side and when he did that he realized and he he basically worshiped the Lord Jesus told him, Thomas, you're blessed because you see. But how much more are those that are going to believe in the things that you see 
they don't get to see, but yet they have faith. Folks, that's talking about us. So you think about that. We are blessed. If we believe God's word, if we believe that Jesus came and died for our sins, was buried and resurrected again, and he's coming back for us, he's going to rule and reign on this earth, we believe God's word, then we are blessed. And God is, puts in us the peace of God. He puts in us joy. And he puts in us hope for the future. And that's what we need to really focus on because God has given us imperishable promises and an inheritance for the future. Folks, that is a beautiful thing. And I don't know how I can express this more to you than we have, we have a great future that lies ahead of us. Hallelujah. All right. Verse 9 obtaining the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls concerning this salvation the prophets who prophesied it about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully so now what he's talking about here is all the old testament prophets isaiah jeremiah ezekiel daniel zechariah Malachi, Jonah, all of those prophets, all of them, they all had glimpses of the coming King of Kings and the plan of salvation and that a Messiah was going to be born and the governments would be upon his shoulder. His name would be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. They knew that a, the God-man was going to come, that he was going to pay all the price for sins, and that he was going to live a sinless life. All of the prophets knew this, they saw this, they anticipated this, they didn't know the time frame that it would come, but they were excited about it, they longed for it, they were anticipated it. That's what he's, he's referring to here. Concerning the salvation and the prophets who prophesied it about the grace that was to be yours, search and acquire carefully, inquiring that, uh, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the, the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those things uh, who preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven things into which angels long to look so here folks we have in Scripture that these prophets prophesied these things they knew it wasn't going to take place in their time but they knew that the things that God showed them and that they would write down was inspired by the Holy Spirit it pointed to Christ it pointed to the coming Messiah and they knew it be, would be for the generations that would come after them so they they longed to see these days and we are extremely fortunate to be living at the end of the age so for the last 2,000 years, anyone who has come and become a born-again child of God has been blessed by faith to trust in God's Word that all the promises of God are going to be filled. <clears throat> and now we're at the very end of that time period. We're at the end of Daniel's 69th week. The 70th week will start the tribulation period, but we're in a holding pattern now until Messiah comes back, and we're right at that time time to, uh, limit right now, and we have a lot to look forward to. So folks, we're going to stop here. We'll pick up the rest of this. There's so much meat in here that I really want to get, get deep down into the uh, the ground with this. I believe it's going to bless you. It's going to encourage you. And what we're going to talk about next time is God's call for every child of God to be holy. 
G Jesus had told us and God had told us in his word to be holy because I'm holy. God speaking. And we need to live a life of holiness. And I'm not talking about what people did in the past where they were very legalistic. They believe you had to look a certain way. That you had to have your hair a certain length. And, you know, women used to put it up in a beehive hairdo. And they would, you know, wear... Uh, dresses that were buttoned up to here. We're not talking about that. Now we're talking about being decent and modest in, in your dress and your apparel, you know, and especially for women not to be exposing themselves um, because their bodies are um, uh, a beautiful thing given by God uh, for man. And the same thing for men. We need to be dressing appropriately and not a way that uh, our flesh is being exposed to where it could tempt somebody else to to sin. We're going to get we're going to get kind of deep into this these next verses on on the next um, video. But I want to encourage you there's a couple of books that I really highly recommend and one of them is it's called The Root of the Righteous by A W Tozer. The Root of Righteousness by A.W. Tozer and I've had this for years it's a small book it's not a real big book but it's got some great insight on how we as Christians need to live our lives the next book is a newer book that I just recently um, received actually the church that I go to they have these special Bible classes Sunday morning before the services and one of them is uh, the Pursuit of Holiness and the class is a thousand times better than I had anticipated. And there's a handout book that they give to everybody that attends the class. And this particular book is called The Pursuit of Holiness. And folks, I highly recommend it. It's not a very thick book. And this book is written by a godly pastor. His name is Jerry Bridges. Jerry Bridges and I highly recommend this book I I have very seldom read a um, something other than the Bible where I am constantly going through it and making notes and highlighting things that are speaking to me folks it's it's time that Christians get serious about their faith that we knuckle down and we get we spend more time with the, chasing the things of God than chasing worldly things that are going to vanish away. And I'm going to dive deep into it on the next episode. The next episode is going to be maybe difficult for certain people to watch. But I promise you if you will open yourselves up to the word of God and let the let the Holy Spirit speak to you, I believe you will benefit from it tremendously. And I'm not, I'm not here to teach you anything, to preach at you anything that I haven't personally already been convicted of, haven't gone through myself, and therefore now the Holy Spirit has laid this on my heart to share with you. And uh, folks, I have not arrived. Uh, I, I still have a long way to go. Uh, like I said in the beginning of 1 Peter, I believe the sanctification process is something that goes on from the time that we become born again to the time that we're either caught up to meet the Lord in the air or we we breathe our last and our body is put in the, into the ground and our spirit and soul goes to heaven. I believe that sanctification work is, is a process that continues. You may disagree and that's fine. We can love each other and, and agree to disagree on certain things and that's and that's fine. But the most important thing here is we all need to grow in Christ. We all need to become more Christ-like. And we need to weed out anything that is not pleasing to the Lord. You know, when we do a spiritual checkup, Lord, is there anything in my life that does not need to be there? Those are the things that are important. That is showing the Lord when we do that in sincerity and in humility, then the Lord will start to reveal those things. And say, you know what? You've been spending too much time with these individuals. I don't know them. They don't love me. 
They, they constantly use foul language. They constantly are drinking alcohol. They are a bad influence on you. And if you continue to spend time with them, they will lead you down the wrong road. Sometimes we have to cut some people out of our life, not completely, but to where we're spending so much time with them. You know, one of the things that a lot of men like to do is spend a lot of time with their buddies. You know, uh, I think it would be beneficial if you're married that you spend more time with your wife. And that's what I like to do. I like to spend time because she's my wife. She's my gift from God. She is my best friend. She's my soulmate. And there's nobody I would rather spend, no fleshly human being that I would rather spend more time with than my wife. Because she's precious to me. And when I travel during the week, I miss her terribly. And we FaceTime each other, and, uh, you know, that's, uh, that, that's not really the same thing, but it makes it a whole lot more, uh, makes it easier for me. But I, I tell men, spend less time doing the things that you think you enjoy and devote yourself to the things of God. And if you do this, you watch and see what God will do in your life. Folks, until next time, may God's grace be upon you. May his mercy be covering you at all times. And may you grow and mature in the Lord. God bless you until next time. Have a great day.